All right, hello everyone for our last week here. We have a couple more topics or, you know, for week number 15. Um, start with section four out of chapter five today. Uh, if you happen to not get my email, I did send one or and I posted on the message board that we're going to change. I'm taking out some of the problems from this section four and five. Uh, mainly, they're just problems that aren't exactly necessary for what you need to do here. So trying to make it a little bit easier, especially I know in this end here, the end of the semester, you're, you're just kind of running out of gas and I don't blame you. So I'm going to, you know, cut out some of the non-essentials. So you can still look at the full PowerPoint slide. As you can see, the one I have on the screen, I'm just going to skip through a few of them that are not going to be, you know, totally relevant to what we're going to be covering here. So they're going to talk about the definite integral. And basically, everything we've been dealing with so far, all the things of the plus C's and all that, those have been known as indefinite integrals. So what they mean, when you have a, an integral that you're taking and you're finding that integral, you're going through that process, obviously your equation is left with X's and all that stuff. So a definite integral is we're actually going to plug in numbers, kind of like plugging numbers into a function. The definite integral is going to do such a thing. So... They, you know, you're going to learn a lot more about the fundamental theorem of calculus, the next section. Um, but this is basically all setting us up for that. So kind of give you a quick idea. You know, I, I, like, I like this chapter because students always ask, when are we going to use this? Well, we've had a lot of word problems where you can kind of see where the calc is used. This is one where you can really see how it's going to happen. What's going to go on here in this case is we're going to have different, uh, what do you call it? Okay, so sorry, in, in the figure here, we're looking at trying to find the area under the curve. That's kind of the key, you know, point of this problem. And if it's any other straight line or circle problem, we can have geometric formulas, you know, the pi r square or the length times width, all these things. But when you start getting curves like this one, it's a little tougher, you know, to, to find a precise area. And that's what integration integrals are going to do. They're going to allow us to find the area under this curve. So now before we get to that, I'm going to show you the, what I call the rectangle approach here. So we're going to go from the boundaries from 1 to 5, and it's all of this shaded area between the x-axis and our curve. And again, the borders are 1 and 5. So it's like, think of it as like we're finding the area between four different curves here. All right, so they call it the area under the graph from 1 to 5, from x equals 1 to x equals 5. And as I mentioned, normal geometric formulas, the things that you had in geometry aren't going to apply here because of the way this thing is curved. So this approach, it's time consuming. So that's part of the things I'm not going to have you do a lot of this, but um, these rectangles we're going to use and we're going to approximate, we're going to estimate the area. All right. So here's the key here. And I can't say this enough. This is an estimate. It's not going to be an exact area here. So here's the deal. We're going to cut this region up, you know, between one and five. We're going to cut it up into four regions. And basically you subtract five minus one, you divide it by the four regions. Every region is going to have a width of one. So I'll jump right in there. So here's the rectangle one. It's going to have a width of one and it goes right up where the top left corner is touching the curve. And we do that for rectangle two, three, and four. And you see here, we can, we call these sub intervals we can actually go and find the area of these four rectangles, okay? Because it's simple as this. Every one of them has a width of one, between one and two, between two and three, three and four, four and five. They all have a width one. Their heights are going to vary, but here's the nice part. If you plug the number one into this function, you're going to get that y value of that point, and that happens to be the height of this rectangle. So if I take the function and find f of one, I've got the rectangle one's height. F of two, I have rectangles two height, F of three, F of four. So in each case, we're gonna multiply them. And we're gonna get these rectangles. Now, when we add these up, it's gonna be called the left sum. But here's the key here. Oh, let me get in here. So this is what I was explaining. F of one, and it's times one, mainly because this rectangle has a width of one right here. So don't forget that part. So when you plug these functions, these in here, you get these areas for the four rectangles, 1.25. Because remember, that's 1.25 times the height of the width of one, that's 1.25. Then it's two times one, 3.25 times one, and five times one. Add all these rectangles up, you get 11.5.
And you notice just by eyeballing it, this is called the left sum, by the way. But if you eyeball it, the actual area that I'm looking for, that under the curve, notice I missed these little wedges right here. So this is an approximation. It's close, but it's going to be a little bit of an underestimate, a little lowball guess of what that area is. So this is actually going to be less than the real area. 11.5 is the area of these four rectangles, but that's an underestimation. Okay, so now try this again, and now we're going to do the same thing where we have our four rectangles, but notice this time we're using the top right. They're going a little higher. So let me go back to the other picture. Notice, see how all my rectangles, it was the top left corner touching the curve. That's why they're all inside the, the, a, the shaded area. Now in this case, it's the top right corner touching the curve, and notice I completely have the brown area, you know, you know, covered, but I have a little excess here. But we can do the same kind of thing. We can find all these areas because these are just four rectangles, and these are right rectangles. This is going to be a capital R, an R sum. Now, the difference, notice, is for this first rectangle, notice now, to get the height of this rectangle, it has to be this side right here. So I have to plug in 2 to the function to get the height of this rectangle. It's obviously higher, and f of 2, this one's going to be f of 3, f of 4. And if you're wondering how I'm getting this, it's just ask yourself, what's the height? So I'll show you right here. Just look, let, let me look at rectangle number 2, for example, right here. I need to know the width and the height. Well, I know the width is 1. I need to figure out that height. Well, this height right here is the one that's touching the function. We're going to use the function to find, function to find that. If I found this height, notice I can't find that height because that's a mystery right there. I don't know what that's touching. I have to go by what corner is actually touching the height, you know, the the uh, the the function there. So when I want to get this one, well, how do I find that? Well, remember the points. That is at x equals three, so that's going to be f of three. That's how I get the second rectangle right there. And then, we, you know, so it's not much different than the last one, but it's just the same kind of process. We find these areas, and you're going to find that when you plug in the numbers and find them, notice these numbers are the same, the 2, the 3.25, and the 5. The difference is there's this higher one over here. But when I add up all these, that's going to be capital R, that's going to give you 17.5, which is going to be an overestimate. Okay, so... Again, go back one slide. The underestimate was 11.5. The overestimate is 17.5. So we still don't have the exact area yet, but at least we know it's somewhere between 11.5 and 7.5. Is it exactly in the middle? Well, no, because it's not an exact straight line here, but it's going to be somewhere kind of in the dead center, 14.5-ish. In that area. So this is kind of the, what I was talking about. R is an overestimate. L is an underestimate. The actual area is somewhere in between. Okay. Now another one here. Notice as you start making more rectangles. So let me go back to that previous picture. See this this little wedge here. This is an overestimate. This this this. All these are the excess. It's like we have to trim the fat. So now when I go to making eight rectangles. Notice what happens is we still have this excess, but there's not as much. And I'm going to kind of show you how it used to be. This is what the first four rectangles look like. So by making more rectangles, notice I've gotten rid of this fat right here, here, and here. I'm, I'm able to remove that. So the more rectangles you get, you're still not going to be exact. You're never going to be exact with the rectangle approach. That's why it's called an approximation. But when you get 8, now we're still overestimating, but notice how it's a little lower. It's getting a little more precise. So the more you do, here they did 16 rectangles. Here they did 200 rectangles, and notice it's getting closer and closer. That's what we're trying to figure out, okay? So the more you get, the, more, the closer you're going to be. So that's all I wanted you to see with the rectangle approach, okay? What I want to talk about here... The fast forward is how to actually find the precise approach. So uh, you can look at this. See, here's a case where this is an overestimation. 
a little too much, whereas this side is going to be the underestimation. And they each have an error. They're going to be off by a little bit, but I'm not going to focus on the error part right now because we're going to get to the actual precision in a second. Okay, anything that involves Riemann sums, don't even worry about them here for this homework and this quiz. I just want you to be able to understand the idea of a rectangle, and then I want us to be able to come up with the actual area. So that's what we're going to jump to next. So I'm going to fast forward through a few of these. Talk about what matters here. Okay, so let me go to this one. The definite integral. If you have a continuous function on an interval a to b, that was like from 1 to 5 on that last example I gave you. We have a definite integral, which looks like this. It's still an integral of a function dx, but now you have this a, b, these little numbers. They look like powers or subscripts or superscripts. Those are the numbers that we're going to go on the function, like the 1 to 5. Okay, a lower limit of integration and an upper limit of in integration. And we're going to use this to find the actual area. Okay, so not the greatest example to start with, but I'll show it to you. What happens is when you have an area under a curve like this, for example, because these are below, you're going to get what's actually kind of a weird concept. You're going to get a negative area. That's why they have this negative A right here. Any area below the x-axis is going to come out to be negative. Any area above the x-axis is going to be positive. But this formula right here, and I'll show you how to do this, how to work this out, is actually going to tell us the effect. Uh, Official exact area. No more approximations with those rectangles. It's going to give us a precise area. So I'll show you a couple of the pictures, then I'll get to the actual math of this in a second here. We want to find the integral from A to B. So this is little a, this is little b. This area right here they give you is 2.12. Okay. So when they want to go from A to B, that means from here to here, it's that area between the curve and the x-axis. And remember, though, because it's below, it's actually going to be a negative 2.2, 2.12. So physically, this area is 2.12, but because your function and because that little shaded area is below the curve, it's actually going to come out to be a negative number when you run the calculation. When I go from C to A, now this is kind of a weird concept because you're not really going to do this. Uh, a to C, I'm sorry. Um, a to C. You will do it, but I want to. we're going to fix this when we get to the problems later on. Now, notice what happens is when you do A to C, it's going to calculate a negative area right here. And then from B to C, it's going to calculate a positive. They're actually going to cancel each other off. So it's not a simple case of just adding these two areas. It's actually going to find the negative 2.12. And then here, the positive 11.9. It's going to add them all up, and that's why your answer is going to come out to be 9.78. Now, if you're doing this in terms of a physical area, you don't want negative areas. I want to know, like, how much fencing do I need? How much grass do I need to calculate this area, you know, to cover this area or dirt or whatever the case? You don't want them canceling off. You want to add the two together. But if you're just to integrate from A to C, what they call integrating from A to C, if there's some parts are negative, some parts are positive, they're going to cancel each other off. And what this picture, these, these slides are doing is they're just trying to show you what you have to look out for when you integrate. Now we're going to integrate from B to C. Well, B to C is all this area B right here, this positive area. But this probably should have been the, the second one we did. But all this is going to be above. It's going to be 11.9. Okay, nothing special when it's above. When I go from A to D, now it's interesting. Here is A. Here is D way over here. So when I integrate it, I'm getting all three of these areas. And remember, anything that's below the curve is going to be a negative. Anything above is going to be a positive. So if you were to plug this formula in and do the math, integrating the function from A to D, you're going to get a 2.12. You're not going to see all this stuff behind the scenes here. If you just plug the numbers in, you get 2.11. And you might wonder, well, how is this area so small? The reason is... There were negative areas they subtracted away, and this is the net. Okay, now this will work ideally when you're doing money examples and things like that. It depends on what you're being asked to find. This might have been a production graph. Well, it was below here, and it was above here, and it was below here, so the net was a positive 2.12, but you have to know the context of the problem you're looking for. Okay, so a couple little properties. You'll learn these quickly. You don't have to memorize these or anything. Integrating from A to A, 
Well, you don't go anywhere. It's just always going to be a zero. Okay. If you go from B to, or sorry, A to B, it's the exact opposite if you went from B to A. And you'll see why when we get to the formula in a couple seconds here. Um, if you have a constant in there, this K, you can always pull that, that constant out and then integrate and then multiply your answer by K. Sometimes that's handy, sometimes that's not necessary. This one might come in handy a little bit more. When you have two functions, you're more than welcome to integrate each individual function. And we've already had this property before, just like these, these, uh, this number three. These still apply, whether you're doing a definite integral like now or an indefinite integral. You can always translate that over. And then the last one, this kind of applies to the, la the, the last example, the picture. If you're going from A to C and there's some point B in the middle, you can break it up into two pieces, kind of like this graph right here. I can go from A to C, but I'd rather, because of this special cut below and above the x-axis, maybe I'm going to integrate just A to B, and then integrate B to C, and then I can add them up, and then I can see what I get. I can combine the answers later. Okay, so show you the actual math how this works here. We're going to find the integral from 1 to 3 of the function 4x to the third. Okay, so... Watch how this is going to happen here. Number one, they know this from this, this stuff on top. So make this clear. This is given. All this stuff up here, this is given. Then they want you to find something different. Now, so we're going to focus on that piece right there. It's almost the same function we have, except for it has a four there. All I have to do is pull that four out, just like we did. Pull it out front so it looks like this. And now, since we know this part, the integral of x to the third from 1 to 3, that is equal to the number 20. We simply multiply our answer by 4, and that's how we get the 80. So that's all it's doing is they're just kind of giving you some information how to do that, how to find that there. Okay, so on part B here, we're doing the same kind of thing. We're going to integrate from 1 to 3. Or, oh, I'm sorry, we have all this. We're going to integrate from 1 to 3 of this whole thing, okay? So again, you're given this, you're given this, you're given all that. You have to figure out what's the appropriate one to use by using those properties. Well, this is a case where I've got two different functions, so I'm gonna make two different integrals. Okay, and you'll see that's what they do right here. They broke this up into two different pieces. One of them is gonna integrate the x cubed, one of them is going to integrate the negative 2x, and you can actually pull out the negative and put it out front because that's just like a constant. So you could have made this a plus and a minus here, or it's a little cleaner to do what they did. They just split it up and they put the negative there. So it's like we're subtracting two integrals. Now we look at what's given. I already know this. Remember? That's this. That's going to be 20. This part right here I actually know also. That's the 8. So all I have to do is subtract those two and get the 12. Okay, so that's all that's going on right here. And this last one, sorry, this next one, same kind of thing. We're going to split this up into two integrals. All right, we already know actually all this is 12. Actually, that, sorry, that was a, a change from the last one. This problem, we already learned this one from the last part. We knew that was 12. Remember that property, if you switch the numbers around, all you do is you stick a negative out in front of it. So that's all you have to do. Okay, now, in real life, these properties aren't going to come up that often. So I hate to, I'm not going to waste a lot of time on it because it, it does not occur much. It's going to be more of, can you calculate it? Can you do this? Because we're going to actually do this in a second here. So what happens is, now our last one, we're going to find this one. If we want to go from one to four, of this, okay? So remember that property. We don't have a one to four up here, but we do have a one to three and a three to four. So remember that property that says, you know, so first off we have this, but this part right here, this one to four, I can do the same thing. I can break that up into two different integrals. One of them going from one to three, one of them is going from three to four. It's like I'm just picking up. So think of it this way. If I look at a picture, like that, and I want to find the area from one to four, all this right here. 
I can go find the area, or I can find that area and that area and add them up together. Okay, in this particular case, what it was was they're saying, you know this area right here from one to three, and you know this area from three to four, just put the two together. That's that's what that property is essentially saying is if you know that you, you know, anytime you have something, you can cut it into two pieces or more and find the individual areas or vice versa. It's very much like if you had a cake and you're trying to find the area of the cake, you can find the area of the cake or you can cut the cake into two pieces and find each of those areas and then add them up. That's always going to be the case for all these. So that's all they did right here is they just figured out, well, we know how to find each of the, we know the answer for those two pieces. Let's split it up. And, you know, and I'll point out, go back one step. If I have an integral from one to four, now, as you saw, we can make it an integral from one to three and three to four, or I could make it from one to two and resume from two and go to four. We can just do that anytime. The reason I didn't do it this time is that's not what we were given. I had to go by what was given in this particular problem. So as long as you find a middle number between one and four or any two numbers, if you're integrating between A and B, and you find a number in between, you can break that integral up and go from A to the number and then pick right back up and go from B to that number in the other piece. Okay, and this one's not really worth showing, but I'll just put it up here real fast. When you're going from integrating from a number to itself, it's always going to be a zero. It doesn't matter what the function is, doesn't matter what the numbers are, always be the case. Okay, so let's do some homework problems here and like I mentioned earlier in this video, and I sent the, the email out, I've got these two different ones. So let me show you how they look on your end. So for your assignments, you should see, I hope, both of these pop up. And so, so just to be clear, if you've already started this one prior to knowing about this, just do this. And I sent an email, I post on the an announcement board. There's about 10, 12 problems I want you to throw out. Don't even do them, just skip them. Okay, if you have not started your homework, don't look at this original one and go to this one that says better. Okay, this is the one where it's got, you know, like I said, it's a reduced number of questions. I just want you to worry about these here. Okay, that's all that, that's all that matters here is these particular problems. So let's look at number three just to show you what's going on. Okay, which of the rectangles below are left rectangles? So remember, there's different rectangles you can have. You're, you're, you're partitioning out the group. A left rectangle is where the left corner is touching the function. So let's go one rectangle at a time. Rectangle A notices where, where you're touching it is actually in the dead center of the top. So that's considered a center rectangle. It's not a left or a right. B, on the other hand, is touching my rectangle on the left. So that's definitely going to be one. Okay, now these boxes mean there is multiple answers possibly. Let's see, you can click three or four if you want. So you got to click all that apply. Select all the left uh, triangles. C, where is it touching? It's touching on the top right corner. That's not one of them. D is touching on the top left, so that's going to be one. E is touching in the middle. That's not going to be one. So my answer should be B and D. Make sure you look at all your choices. F is there's no rectangles, no left rectangles. That's it for that one. That's all that, that question number three is asking. Okay, so same thing on some of these here. Um, let me see if question five and six and seven should be all the same. Yeah. Calculate the definite integral by referring to the figure with the indicated areas. So they give you all these areas. They want us to integrate from A to C. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in on this picture just so we get a better idea here. They want us to integrate from little a to little c. So that's going to be from here all the way to here. They want to know these areas. Now remember, if I was asking you to find the three areas, then you would take all three and add them up. But because you're integrating, you have to consider above and below. Who's a negative area? Who's a positive area? Excuse me, that's going to be a positive area. That's going to be a positive. This one below is going to be a negative. So when I combine them, area A is going to be positive, 1.493. B is going to be a negative, 2.615. And C is going to be a positive. And remember, it's all about where is it located with respect to the x-axis. 
any parts of your graph below the x-axis are going to always give you negative areas. Okay? Anything above is going to give you a positive area. So I now need to just consider that. So when I add these up, I get the 1.493 minus 2.615 plus the 5.117. And now that's how I get this 3995. That's the answer that you have here. Okay? So again, don't just add the three regions up. If one or more of the regions is below, you have to put a negative in front of those. Okay, so let's look at number 11. You're not going to have a whole lot on this one, so I'm going to, you know, get another video out to you shortly. But, you know, I want to at least get you started on this on these problems, just to make sure you're good to go. And, and number, the section five, I'm sorry, that's where you get a little bit more of the, the written work. Okay, so in this case, it's the same kind of problem. Calculate the indefinite, in, or sorry, the definite integral by referring to the figure. We're going from A to, or sorry, in this case, we're going from C to A. Now, remember, as I said, when you go backwards, in real life, you're not going to be going reverse. It usually is going to be the smaller numbers on the bottom, the bigger numbers on top. But <coughs> if that's the case, we have to deal with it. All it is is it's the opposite. So I'll show you how I approach this. First, let's go from A to C. That's what I want to find. I want to know that to that right there. So kind of like last time, that's going to be a positive area. That's going to be positive. That's going to be a negative. So when I calculus, calculate this, I get a 4.5. The, the B area is going to be a negative, so one point, negative 1.688. And the C area is going to be positive 10.8. So when I integrate from A to C, that is what it's going to be, just like the last problem I had. Okay, so it's going to be 4.5 minus 1.688 plus 10.8. Oops. I do it again, sorry. 4.5 minus 1.688 plus 10.8. And we get a 13.612. Now, this is the part that's frustrating. I'm going to do this and show you on purpose. If I type that in there, like most people, you'd see this and say, okay, that looks good to me. And then you're going to see, oh, you got it wrong. The reason is, this is the integral from A to C. If it's C to A, remember that property, it's the exact opposite. It's going to be negative, and that's why the answer is correct. Okay? All right, so that's it for that particular case. Now, let's look at number 15 just to see where we're at. Yeah. Okay, so number 15. They want us to calculate this. This is like the last example in, in the, uh, um, the PowerPoint. You're given this information, and we need to find a specific integral. So we're going to integrate from 4 up to 10, and the function is 7x squared dx. Now, the first thought is, Look and see, do you have a 7x square in these givens? Well, no, I have an x, I have an x square, I have an x square. So I don't have a 7, so the first step is, remember, constants can be pulled out. You can't pull x's out, but you can pull constants. So now we're looking for the integral of x squared, and we do have two of those. Okay, now they want us to go from, from 4 to 10. We're not given 4 to 10, we're given 4 to 9 and 9 to 10. So this is where you have to remember that other property. I can rewrite this as 4 to 9. And then I pick right up and go from 9 to 10 of the same function. So that's that break I told you. You're going from 4 to 10. And you can pick any point in between and say, you know what? Let's split this and say, go 4 to that number and then re resume right back up. So if you look at these two, 4 to 9, 9 to 10, it's like a range. And it's like me saying, drive from the four-foot mark to the nine-foot mark, 
and then pick right back up and go from the nine to 10, it's the same thing as going right from four to 10. Same exact thing right there, okay? So now, <clears throat> where are we at here? We now know, oh, one little thing I missed, don't forget, that seven should be in front of both of these. It distributes through. Or you can have seven in front and just multiply it to your entire answer. Either way, this is probably a little bit easier. It fits the model that we had. So seven times all of this, which was given to us, is that six, six, five over three. And then seven times this, what was given to us, was two, seven, one over three. And notice when they tell you this right here, the entire integral equals 271 over three. It's not the integral equals an integral. They tell you the integral from nine to 10 of x squared dx is equal to the number 271 over three. So it's a complete replacement. Okay, so now at this point, I can use my calculator. Um, oops, sorry, let me show you what I would type in here. If you guys have, and notice they want an integer or an, a simplified fraction. So what you don't do, don't do 665 divided by three and get this decimal. They want an exact answer, no approximation. <clears throat> so what I will do is say 665 times seven so that that first fraction is rewritten as four, six, five, five over three. The second fraction, it's seven times two, seven, one on the top. That second fraction is 1897 over three. And now I just add them up with the common denominator, 1897 plus four, six, five, five. And that gives you six, five, five, two. Now, you may or you may not see, does this thing reduce? Is that gonna be divisible by three? Do I leave it as this? Now, if you left it as this, I believe you're gonna get it wrong, but we're gonna do this, but let's just see. Oh, can I reduce this? Just divide it by three. Here's the answer. If you get a fraction, if you get a decimal, then, then leave it as it was right here. If you don't get a decimal like this, you get a whole number, then this is the number you put in, 2184. Now that's the number they want. Um, I'm gonna say, just for fun, I'm gonna type in the, simp the fraction that was not simplified, the 6552. It might work, it might not. It does want a simplified fraction, but let's try it. Yeah, because it's not reduced down, that's not gonna be the answer. So maybe that tells you, oh, I can't reduce. Let's try the 2184, and then if we get it, we get it wrong, nope, we're good. All right, so there's your answer on that one. Okay, and let's look at number 19. I think we're getting into the, I think this, yeah, the next section. Um, so what I'm gonna do here, that's pretty much it for 5.4. That's all I need you to know out of 5.4. I wanna just start talking about how it works, okay? Now, they're gonna have you do geometric formulas. I'm gonna give you something real quick, just kind of a, to get the ball rolling here and show you how this stuff works. In fact, let me actually pull up a PowerPoint. Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna draw on a blank screen here just to show you how this works. Cause I know that there's a lot of stuff everywhere and hopefully this will make it clear. I, I understand the process is this book wants you to, they kind of want you to see it in a certain way to get the concept. Um, I'm one of those where sometimes I'd like to just jump right in here. So what it means to get a definite integral, okay? So here's the concept. First off, you integrate this like you normally would. This becomes an x cubed over three, okay? Forget the numbers. The one and the four have nothing to do with how you integrate. So step one, you integrate how you always would. And then, depending on your book, I think your book uses this line then they put that little one and four over here. What this is saying is it's it's because you're done integrating, so you no longer need the integration symbol, but you still need to get that one and four. We're going from one to four. So this is just kind of telling you, oh yeah, don't forget the one and the four. So here's how the process works. You're gonna take the answer you just got and you're gonna plug in the four. Then you're gonna take the answer you got for the smaller number 
and you're going to put in the 1. So you basically plug in the 1 and the 4, and then you subtract your answers. So this is going to give us a 64 over 3 minus a 1 over 3. And my answer is 63 over 3. Did I get that right? 63 over 3. I can reduce that down. Sorry. Okay. And we get here. 63 over 3, 21. Okay. That's the method of integration. That's what we're going to be doing here for this last part. All right, so if you look at this graph right here, you know what an x square function looks like pretty much. If I asked you to find the area between 1 and 4, the process is you integrate. You plug in the numbers from the start to the end, and you subtract them, and that's going to tell you the area right there. That area... It's not an approximation, it's exactly 21, okay? That's the procedure that we have to do here, all right? And that's, that's what we're going to be doing in this last section. So I just wanted to give you a little precursor to that. So like I said, I'm going to record this. I'll post this video. I'll record another one shortly so you can kind of pick right up and then get right in here. But that'll be our last topic, okay? So if this stuff is, is troubling you that we covered here today, let me know if you have any questions. If not, uh, look for that other video, and then I'll, I'll give kind of a review or talk about how our semester is going to wrap up. All right, have a good one.